In the heart of the ancient world, the Roman Republic stood as a beacon of power and civilization. Its legions marched across lands far and wide, bringing under its dominion vast territories and diverse peoples. Yet within its own borders, a storm was brewing, a storm that would test the very fabric of Roman authority. The year was 91 BC, and Rome, the Eternal City, bustled with the energy of a thriving metropolis. Senators debated in the hallowed halls of the Curia, merchants bartered in the Forum, and in the streets, the voices of the Roman plebeians mixed with those of their Italian allies, the Soci. These allies, integral to Rome's military might, came from all over the Italian peninsula, each with their own customs and languages, yet bound to Rome by treaties and blood. But beneath this veneer of unity, resentment simmered. The Italian allies had long been crucial to Rome's conquests, fighting alongside Roman legions, sharing in the hardships of war. Yet they remained citizens of a lesser class. They lacked the rights and privileges of Roman citizens, most importantly, the right to vote. This inequality had grown more pronounced with each passing year, and now whispers of discontent echoed through the Italian countryside. The Roman Senate, a body of patricians and wealthy plebeians, remained largely indifferent to these growing tensions. To them, the socii were but tools in Rome's grand design, necessary but never equals. This arrogance, coupled with the Senate's reluctance to address the Allies' grievances, set the stage for a conflict that would shake the Republic to its core. As the sun set over the Tiber, casting long shadows on the cobbled streets of Rome, few could imagine that the coming years would see brother turn against brother, and the Italian peninsula plunged into a war that would be remembered for generations to come. In the mountains of central Italy, the Marsi, a proud and fierce people, had long been staunch allies of Rome. They, like many other Italian tribes, had seen their lands and rights diminished over time. The passage of the Lex Licinia Mucia in 95 BC, a law aimed at expelling those who falsely claimed Roman citizenship, had added fuel to the fire of their discontent. Among the Marsi, a leader emerged, Quintus Papadio Silo, a man of charisma and vision, who saw the growing injustice and dared to dream of change. He spoke passionately to his people, urging them to stand up for their rights, to demand what was rightfully theirs, Roman citizenship. In Rome, the situation was no less tense. Marcus Livius Drusus, a tribune of the plebs, recognized the brewing crisis. He proposed a series of reforms, including the extension of citizenship to the Italian allies. Drusus was a man ahead of his time, believing in a greater, more inclusive Rome. But his vision was met with fierce opposition from various factions within the Senate. Landowners fearing the loss of their privileges, senators wary of his growing influence, and plebeians afraid of sharing their rights with a multitude of new citizens. Drusus's efforts, though noble, were in vain. The Senate rejected his reforms, deepening the divide between Rome and its allies. The Italian tribes, feeling betrayed and marginalized, began to conspire in secret. Meetings were held in shadowed woods and secluded valleys, oaths were sworn and plans were made. The Marsi, the Samnites, the Lucanians and others once loyal to Rome, now prepared to challenge the might of the Republic. The assassination of Drusus under mysterious circumstances was the final straw. To many allies, he was their last hope for peaceful resolution. His death was not just a loss of a reformist voice, but a signal that Rome would not bend. The Marsi, under the leadership of Silo, decided to take a stand. They, along with other tribes, formed the Italian Confederacy, a union of states with a singular goal, equality with Rome. 
And so, in 91 BC, the drums of war began to beat. The Italian countryside, once tranquil and fertile, bristled with the movement of troops. The Marsi, the heart of the rebellion, prepared for war, knowing well that they were about to face the greatest military force of their time. But in their hearts burned the fire of freedom, a fire that would soon engulf the entire Italian peninsula. As the year 91 BC unfolded, the Italian peninsula was like a chessboard, with Rome and the Confederacy positioning their pieces. In Rome, the Senate, now fully aware of the gravity of the situation, scrambled to respond. Some called for negotiation, others for immediate military action. The voices of moderation were drowned out by cries for war. In the Italian Confederacy, the leaders gathered to formulate their strategy. Quintus Papadio Silo, alongside other tribal leaders like Gaius Papius Mutilus of the Samnites, emerged as key figures. They knew the odds were against them. Rome's legions were battle-hardened and numerous. But the Italians had their strengths, knowledge of the land, fierce determination, and a cause that united them across tribal lines. As the tension escalated, skirmishes broke out. Roman outposts and colonies in disputed areas were targeted. The Italians, using guerrilla tactics, harried Roman supply lines and ambushed small detachments. Rome, caught off guard by the ferocity and coordination of these attacks, struggled to maintain control. The heart of the conflict lay not just in military might, but in the power of ideals. For the Confederacy, this was a fight for recognition and rights. For many Romans, it was a defense of their way of life and the superiority of Roman citizenship. The Senate, still divided, appointed consuls who were more inclined to military solutions than diplomatic ones. Meanwhile, the life of the common people, both in Rome and among the Italian tribes, was marked by uncertainty and fear. Families were torn apart as sons and fathers were called to arms. In Rome, the plebeians worried about the future, while in the Confederacy, there was a sense of grim determination, a resolve to see the struggle through, no matter the cost. As 90 BC dawned, the conflict that many had hoped to avoid was fully realized. The Italian war, as it would come to be known, was not just a clash of armies, but a clash of cultures, identities, and visions for the future of the Italian peninsula. The assassination of Roman officials in Asculum was the spark that turned the smoldering conflict into a blazing inferno. The news spread like wildfire, reaching every corner of the Republic and the Confederacy. For Rome, it was an unforgivable act of treachery. For the Italians, a tragic but necessary step in their quest for justice. Rome's response was swift and brutal. The Senate, now united in their resolve, declared war on the Confederacy. Legions were mobilized, led by experienced generals like Lucius Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Strabo. Their orders were clear, Quell the rebellion and restore Roman authority over the Italian peninsula. The first major battles were fierce and bloody. The Romans, with their superior numbers and discipline, initially gained the upper hand. But the Italians fought with a desperation and ferocity that surprised the Roman commanders. The battles of Nola, Canusium and Tolinus River were among the early significant clashes each marked by heavy casualties on both sides. In these early stages, the war was characterized by a series of sieges and counter-sieges. Roman forces attempted to regain control of key towns and strongholds that had fallen into Italian hands. The Confederacy, meanwhile, aimed to consolidate its control over the territory it claimed and to capture strategic locations that could be used as bases for further operations. Amidst the chaos of war, stories of heroism and tragedy emerged. 
Roman and Italian soldiers, once neighbors and friends, now faced each other on the battlefield. The war was not just a series of tactical maneuvers and engagements, it was also a deeply personal struggle, tearing at the fabric of communities and families. As the war progressed, it became clear that it would not be a short conflict. Both sides had resources and determination, and both were willing to pay a high price for victory. The Italian war had become a crucible, testing the resolve and character of all who were caught in its flames. As the war dragged into its second year, the scope and intensity of the conflict grew. The Roman legions, under the command of capable generals like Gnaeus Pompeius Strabo and Lucius Julius Caesar, pushed deeper into Confederate territory. Their strategy was clear, to crush the rebellion by targeting its heartlands and cutting off its supply lines. The battles became larger and more complex. The Romans, with their superior logistics and organization, were able to field larger armies and coordinate their movements across multiple fronts. But the Confederates, fighting on their home turf, used their intimate knowledge of the terrain to their advantage, launching ambushes and surprise attacks that often caught the Romans off guard. One of the key battles of this period was the Battle of Asculum, where Roman forces, despite their numerical superiority, faced stiff resistance from the Confederate army. The fighting was brutal and prolonged, with neither side willing to give ground. The Romans eventually emerged victorious, but it was a Pyrrhic victory, with heavy losses on both sides. Meanwhile, in Rome, the war was taking its toll. The constant demand for troops and resources strained the Republic's finances and manpower. Dissent began to grow among the Roman populace, weary of the endless conflict and the mounting casualties. Amidst the chaos, a new figure rose to prominence in the Roman political scene, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. A skilled general and astute politician, Sulla recognized the need for a decisive strategy to end the war. He advocated for a more aggressive approach, pushing for a direct assault on the Confederate strongholds and the heart of their resistance. By 89 BC, the tide of the war began to turn in Rome's favor. Sulla, now in command of a large Roman force, embarked on a series of campaigns that would prove crucial. His military acumen and ruthless tactics gradually wore down the Confederate resistance. The Confederates, though resilient, were gradually being pushed back. The loss of key territories and the continuous strain of warfare began to take its toll. The unity of the Italian Confederacy, once its greatest strength, started to show cracks as different groups suffered losses and began to question the continued viability of the war. In one of the pivotal moments of the war, the Roman Senate passed the Lex Iulia, a law that offered Roman citizenship to any Italian community that laid down its arms and pledged loyalty to Rome. This strategic move was aimed at breaking the unity of the Confederacy by offering a tempting incentive for surrender. The Lex Iulia had a significant impact. Many Italian communities, exhausted by the war and enticed by the promise of Roman citizenship, began to defect. The Confederate leadership struggled to maintain cohesion as the allure of Roman citizenship eroded the resolve of their supporters. Despite the setbacks, leaders like Quintus Papadio Silo and Gaius Papius Mutilus continued to fight, rallying their forces for what they knew would be the final stand. The battles of this period were marked by desperation and a fierce determination on both sides. The final year of the war, 88 BC, saw the last desperate efforts of the Confederate forces. But the momentum was firmly with Rome. Sulla's campaigns had effectively decimated the Confederate armies, and the Lex Iulia had significantly weakened their base of support. 
The final battles were more like mop-up operations, with Roman forces systematically reclaiming Confederate-held territories. The leaders of the Confederacy, realizing the futility of further resistance, began to surrender, one by one. With the war effectively over, Rome set about consolidating its control over the Italian peninsula. The Lex Iulia was fully implemented, granting Roman citizenship to the Italian allies. This momentous change, though born out of conflict, transformed the nature of the Roman Republic. It expanded the citizenry and laid the foundation for a more integrated and unified state. The aftermath of the war was a time of rebuilding and reconciliation. The scars of the conflict were deep, both physically on the landscape and emotionally among the people. Families mourned their lost ones and communities worked to rebuild what had been destroyed. The War of the Allies had far-reaching consequences. It altered the political and social landscape of Rome and Italy. The extension of Roman citizenship helped to dissolve the distinctions between Romans and Italians, leading to a more homogenous society. Yet, it also marked the beginning of the end for many local cultures and traditions, which were gradually absorbed into the expanding Roman identity. The War of the Allies, though overshadowed by the later civil wars of the Roman Republic, was a defining moment in its history. It tested the limits of Roman power and the resilience of its society. The war had begun as a struggle for rights and recognition, but it ended with the transformation of the Republic itself. In the centuries that followed, the legacy of the war was felt in the continued expansion and evolution of the Roman state. The Italian allies, once distinct and separate, became an indistinguishable part of the Roman fabric, contributing to its strength and diversity. As historians and poets chronicled the events of the war, they reflected on the irony of conflict, how a war fought to preserve the status quo had instead catalyzed profound change. The War of the Allies, with all its tragedy and triumph, had reshaped the course of history, setting the stage for the rise of an empire that would endure for centuries. Before we part ways, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you for joining me on this historical adventure. Your support and engagement truly bring this channel to life. Lastly, if you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up and feel free to share your thoughts and insights in the comments below. Was there a particular moment in the story that stood out to you? Let's continue the discussion.